function. Uh, it's quite easy to add this function because square root is, is already there and cube root is almost the same, so it's just copying and pasting. Uh, it probably uh, isn't that easy if it's your first contribution to Python, but as far as contributions goes, this is an easy one. Uh, so we uh, posted a pull request as well, uh, which is always nice, but you don't have to do that if you just want to get something in. And uh, there was some discussion on this GitHub issue. Uh, and it was very positive. Uh, it uh, turns out this function fits into the math module because most of the things the math module does is wrapping the C library for math. So uh, C Python is written in C, there's a C library that uh, does maths, and uh, there is a function called SQRT, and there's a function called CBRT, so uh, why did we have one and not the other? Uh, the function exists in not only in C, but also in NumPy, JavaScript, Java R, uh, has the same name everywhere, so uh, why not in Python? Uh, there is a very easy alternative to the cube root, which is raising a number to the uh, uh, to one third, but this is subtly wrong for negative numbers. So uh, cube root has two roots, and uh, this will give you the uh, uh, complex number, which you probably don't want, so CBRT is better. Uh, there was one big question. Why wasn't this done before? Why do you think we didn't have cube root in the math module before? It's not used as often, that's true, but then you know we don't have a general nth root, and that's probably not get, going to get added. So the actual reason is that not only Python has versions, C and the C library, which math wraps, uh, also has versions, and cube root was added 11 years ago. Uh, and Python 3.11 just switched uh, to the new, uh, to the new uh, C standard. So these are not releases. Uh, C is actually a standardized language, so there's a document saying what it should do, and then all the different compilers try to follow that standard, or not. Uh, last time Python switched standards was in uh, 2017, where it took the, uh, basically the original standardized, uh, 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 standardized version, which uh, was used in uh, Python 2, when, you know, uh, we decided we should say what version of C we are using, uh, uh, which was, I think it was Python 1, uh, 2, 1. Uh, that one is very old. And it was missing some uh, some e some features that the programmers wanted. Uh, so in 2017, we added some features from the newer standards, which the compilers were uh, actually supporting. Uh, why did we wait so long? I mean, it's it was 18. The, the C standard was 18 years old at this point uh, in 2017. So the reason, uh, the, like the major reason uh, Python added so, uh, waited so long is because not all the relevant compilers actually supported the standard. So the, there's a committee for C and they write a document and they say, you know, here's the new version of C and now you have to support it. And uh, some compiler vendors said, well, uh, no, this is too hard for us. We don't really care about C. Uh, so uh, the, a major compiler, the, the Microsoft uh, Visual Studio, I think it was, didn't actually support the standard, so Python couldn't switch to it. Uh, they only uh, supported some of the features from the standard, uh, and uh, you know Python, uh, Python used that. And it turns out uh, the Microsoft compiler never actually implemented the uh, nine, the. Uh, 1999 standard of C. Uh, what they did do is get into the C committee and uh, convinced everybody that the features they don't want to support will be optional in the new version of, uh, of the standard. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, so in 2011, there was a new version of the C standard, and they say, you know, these old features are optional. You don't have to support them anymore. Uh, and uh, uh, now all the major compilers uh, supported, uh, supported that version. Why didn't P Python switch then? Python didn't switch, I think, because it's much easier to just work around the missing features for an individual contributor than to go and convince uh, everyone that you know we should switch. That's a fairly large amount of work, unless there's something you can't work around. Uh, so uh, you know, there, there was no, not much reason to switch. Uh, but now it was brought up, and we decided it's, it's time. Uh, we'll skip the standard we were waiting for and go to the newer version that compilers actually uh, support. Turns out there's a new version of the C standard. Uh, I have no idea when Python will switch to that. It's, uh, it's too new. Uh, turns out, uh, I don't think Adjith actually knew about all this. He might, uh, she might, I don't know. <laughs> Haven't researched that much, uh, but I just think uh, they were lucky. Well, it just happened that uh, Python just switched, enabled new uh, new things, and now we have the key root in math, which is one of the many little changes you probably won't notice until a few years from now. Uh, let me talk about uh, some bigger changes. Who here has played with exception groups? Two people. <laughs> Ooh. Uh, okay, well, I'll ask you again in a year, maybe, and uh, the answer will not change that much. Uh, <laughs> who here uses async IO? Oh, okay, so maybe the, ch uh, the answer will change more if you can upgrade your code bases. Uh, so uh, async IO, uh, if you're not aware, is... Uh, uh, is a framework for solving this problem. You want to download three different web pages, so you uh, call a function to download one of them, uh, wait for it, uh, then call a function uh, that to download the other one, wait for that, then call the function that to download the third one, uh, and wait for that, which takes quite a long time if you have many pages to download. So with async IO, you can do this. You can uh, start downloading the pages, uh, all of them at once, uh, and then, as they are ready, you can, uh, you can get the result. Uh, the difference here is that between the starting of the tasks and waiting for the tasks, all the tasks are running at once. So they, uh, it, it takes as much time as getting the, uh, the slowest page. What's actually happening under the covers is that the, the Python is switching between the tasks, so there's always one running at a time. But that doesn't matter for I.O., input-output, uh, communicating with uh, another web server, uh, because uh, most of the time is spent waiting for a reply, right? Uh, so this is basically what async I.O. was designed for. Uh, it's probably what you all use it for. Uh, uh, so since this is about stories, let me tell you a bit about the async I.O. future. Uh, async IO was introduced in Python 3.3. Uh, at that time, it was very different from what it is today. Uh, and once it got into the standard library and people started using it, it actually started influencing the language itself. Uh, so before, uh, when it was introduced, it used uh, yield-based coroutines. Does anybody remember yield from based coroutines? Well, not as many people. Uh, fun times, not fun times. Does that, uh, did anybody uh, deal with callbacks in async IO? Wow, a lot of people. So that was even before the coroutines. That was not fun, was it? Uh, so this await keyword uh, was added actually uh, some years after async IO itself when it turned out that it's a nice abstraction and it's, uh, it's better when it's in the language itself. We can have stuff like uh, asynchronous for statements, asynchronous with statements. Uh, later on, uh, 
we got asynchronous everything, uh, and now we're getting exception groups. Why are we getting that? So uh, there's actually a bit more of the story. Before AsyncIO, there was a bunch of asynchronous framework for, for Python, and many of these are still around. Uh, async core was in the standard library uh, for a very long time, and it shows its age. It's actually been deprecated in 3.11, so if you're still using it, please stop or maybe copy it into your own base and let it run. Uh, but there's also Twisted, GFN, Tornado, uh, and all of these frameworks have had the issue that they weren't compatible with, with each other. So if you had a library for one and a library for another, you can use them in the same app. AsyncIO solved this issue by uh, providing a common layer that uh, everything uh, async is supposed to be compatible with. And it, it's pretty good at that, especially with the async and await. Uh, but async.io isn't the only modern Python library. Right? It's, it's the standard that got introduced to unify all other standards, but of course people came up with their own libraries. Uh, the first big one was Curio by David Beasley, which is uh, much smaller than async.io. It uh, doesn't uh, focus so much on the IO part, on the uh, communicating with networks and stuff like that but it focuses more on, on the actual uh, asynchronous uh, uh, task scheduling. And since it's much smaller, it can, uh, it can uh, uh, well, the author can do some experiments with it, uh, uh, and it uh, doesn't have to be as stable as async.io. The second big one is Trio, uh, which was uh, created at first by Nathaniel Smith, uh, who happens to be uh, to have an academic background, has a PhD, uh, and uh, really thought about how this asynchronous uh, uh, stuff should work, right? So uh, asyncIO was very practical, right? You uh, can write a server with it, uh, but uh, Trio is actually based on on research. Uh, on programming language theory uh, about how this should work. So what's the, what's the main problem with the async.io style task management? Uh, async.io is really nice in creating tasks. So you can say, you know, start these uh, three tasks to uh, download three web pages. Uh, but then you really need to uh, wait for all those tasks. Once you start a task, you really need to wait for it. Uh, you, if it's downloading a web page, you probably want the result, so you need to get the result. But if it's just a task that's uh, you know, a notification or something, you don't really care about the result, you still need to wait for it and make sure that it didn't fail. Uh, that's what the await does. It uh, allows you to, uh, to know if the task failed. What happens if you forget uh, one of the weights? You know, the task goes away and you never hear about it, uh, except in maybe in some, uh, some log somewhere, you know, where it says, you know, this task was never awaited. Uh, who was spent more than two hours debugging that? <laughs> task not awaited. Whoa, that's not too many hands. You're all too shy. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, uh, the solution to this, there is a solution, is something called structured concurrency, uh, which was a research concept uh, that Nathaniel uh, put into the Trio library, and uh, it uh, works like this. You open, uh, Trio calls it a nursery, uh, something that holds all the tasks, and then you create the tasks within that nursery, and uh, then uh, when uh, it is time to collect the results, uh, all the created tasks uh, are waited for. So it's not possible for the tasks to go its own way and disappear from you, right? So this is actually a very powerful concept. Uh, Nathaniel made a blog post c comparing this to go to in older languages. Uh, Creating task is like a go-to. Uh, it's not structured. 
but if you have this, you can be sure that if you start a task, you, uh, you, you then wait for the result. Uh, and this is a very good concept, and uh, like with many things in Trio, AsyncIO is actually moving towards that. Right? Trio serves a bit like uh, the research playground for AsyncIO. Uh, the problem with AsyncIO is that uh, it has a lot of historical baggage, it needs to be backwards compatible, so it's not as fast as it could be. On the other hand, AsyncIO has a much uh, uh, better chance of uh, affecting the language itself. So, uh, in AsyncIO in Python 3.11, you can uh, do this. It's exactly the same thing like in Trio, except with different names. Uh, they don't use creative names in AsyncIO. Everything is boring. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, this is the same concept. And one thing that Trio struggled with is what happens if uh, two of those downloads fail? You should get an exception, but which one? Do you get uh, the exception from task one or from task two? What would you do? Whichever comes first, right. And then you cancel all the other ones, right? You want all of them. Yeah, people generally want all of them. Uh, this is also good uh, if you don't have like downloads, but uh, if you uh, have a bunch of configuration tasks, for example, uh, like in Ansible or something, uh, you want to uh, do as many of those configurations or, or configure as many machines as you can and get notified about the ones, who, the ones that failed, right? And for this, uh, there's a new concept uh, in Python 3.11, which is modeled after Trio multi-errors, uh, which is called exception groups. So it's a new kind of exception that bundles a bunch of different exceptions inside. And uh, it has this uh, nice little uh, feature where you can use accept star. That's a new addition to the syntax. Uh, where you handle individual types of errors within the multi-error. And th if that is all of them, then uh, there's no multi -error, there's no exception group anymore and everything's fine. If some of these were status errors and some of those were, I don't know, value errors, then this will catch the status errors and let the value errors propagate on. It's all uh, very well thought out, uh, quite complicated, uh, but that's where we are now. Uh, now, how did this feature get in? It uh, was actually added by the main AsyncIO developers. So, uh, Erit is a relatively new uh, Python core developer who uh, helps around with a lot of stuff, but uh, uh, she basically took on this project uh, and did uh, a lot of the work. Uh, Yure is uh, someone who has a lot of knowledge about AsyncIO and uh, started a company built on, uh, well, now, now it's a bit more, but uses AsyncIO a lot and knows a lot about the in internals. And there's also the original author of uh, AsyncIO uh, and Python, Guido. Uh, and uh, the PEP also has a note thanking Nathaniel for his uh, work on Trio that was basically copied. Now, uh, what is this PEP 654? Who knows what that is? Huh, who has heard about PEP 8? What is PEP 8? So it's a document, right, it's a standard. It, it, it's a document. It's a, it's a page you can read. It's basically a, a blog post or something like that. Uh, and when there, uh, so there's several kinds of PEPs, several kinds of these documents. Some of some are like PEP8, which is, uh, uh, you know, so some standard that uh, you know, information that we uh, we should all know. Uh, but the majority of PEPs are Python enhancement proposals which is uh, why they're called PEPs. Uh, and whenever there's a major feature that needs a lot of this discussion, uh, you're supposed to write a document about it, uh, get some discussion, 
uh, put the results in the of the discussion into this document, and once everybody agrees with it, uh, the feature can go in. So that's what happened here. Uh, somebody sat down, uh, talked about why these exceptions are good, why this particular uh, implementation is good, uh, got feedback on it, uh, with, and uh, improved the implementation. Uh, finally, uh, it got into Python 3.11. Uh, one thing that happens quite often uh, is that uh, the PEPs are reduced in scope uh, as the discussion goes on. So there was a detail in this one about attaching notes to the individual exceptions, uh, which got cut out because people didn't agree with it and uh, the authors of the PEP wanted the feature to go in. So they went in without attaching notes uh, to the exception. But then they wrote a new PEP and then that, that happens quite often, right? Uh, you uh, get agreement on a big feature, uh, cut something out of it, and leave it for a future date. If this didn't get into 3.11, eh, not so much a big deal. It would get into 3.12 probably. Uh, the main point is that the feature would be, uh, uh, would be complete and would be good because once it's in Python, we can't really change it. People start depending on it and... Uh, yeah, backwards compatibility is a big deal. How much time do I have left? Roughly 25 minutes, including Q&A. Nice. All right. Uh, I have another feature for you, which is TumbleLib. Uh, does anybody know what Tumble is? Ooh, a lot of people. Uh, so Tumble is a serialization format similar to JSON. I hope a lot of you know about JSON. Uh, any uh, CSVP list, uh, lots of things that Python has support for uh, in the standard library. There is a new one now, which is a uh, bit weird because uh, normally it wouldn't get in. So why did this get in? Uh, first of all, why Tomo? Why this weird, uh, weird configuration language? Widely used? Eh, maybe. Any other guesses? Easy to, read. Easy to read. Yeah, sure. <laughs> In simple cases, yes, it's easy to read. Uh, any other guesses? It's used, by Rust. it's used by Rust. Well, that's uh, that's maybe one reason. But yes, the packaging system uses it. So there's a new standard called PyProject.toml, uh, which gives you information about a package. Uh, and uh, all the package building tools like setup tools, flat poetry, PDM, uh, and others uh, should support this, right? So it's a shared standard. Uh, and uh, one thing it does that's not shown here is it uh, tells pip or other front ends uh, what tool to use for building a package. And then it has different uh, you know, fields like the uh, name of the package and stuff like that. You used to put in setup.pi or setup.cfg or uh, various kinds of configs. Uh, so now it's a, in a standardized place. Uh, so that's, uh, that's why it got in. Uh, why was Tomo chosen for this in the packaging world? Uh, that was actually added in 2016 in PEP uh, 518. Uh, and there's a nice little table in that PEP uh, comparing all the different formats, uh, saying that YAML is not easy for humans to edit. <laughs> no, it's not really. Uh, or for tools. Uh, JSON is not really easy to edit either. Uh, any isn't standardized, so uh, basically other languages couldn't read it properly. And Tomal was already used in Rust, as somebody said, so uh, it seemed like the best choice. So that's why Tomal. Uh, for simple cases, it really is easy to use, and packaging so far has the simple cases, so it's nice. Uh, now, uh, Oh, 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 
Oh, sorry. Uh, there is a bunch of existing Tom libraries. So you can uh, pip install one of those and read and write Toml uh, quite easily. Uh, why did we add this to the standard library? Why didn't we just leave it to PyPI packages? Because this is what would happen right now. The packaging ecosystem for Python is at the point where uh, we don't usually add things to the standard library if uh, there's not a very good reason to add them. Uh, and normally, Toml would be one of these cases, right? If you want to read this format, why not uh, add a dependency? You do it for any other format, uh, and it's not a big deal. Uh, so why Toml in particular? It was to uh, solve one specific problem, and that is the bootstrap loop. Because to build a package that can read the Toml format, you need a tool that can build Python packages. But to write a tool that can build Python packages, you need to re read pyproject.toml. Uh, so you need a package that can uh, read toml. But uh, how can you get that if you uh, can't build it yet? Right? It's this chicken and egg problem. Uh, nowadays, well, I mean, well, it, and in the PyPI ecosystem, it can be solved by just downloading a, a pre-built version. Uh, but if you're actually building things from source, it's a major problem. And there are a lot of situations where things are built from scratch. And uh, this was usually solved by vendoring or bundling one of the uh, Toml libraries uh, into the package build tools. Uh, now that it's in the standard library, everything is much easier. There's another question. PyProject Toml was standardized for packaging in 2016. Why is it only added to the standard library now? Any guesses? It is slow? Python is slow? <laughs> that is, Python is slow, and that is the major reason why we <laughs> delegate to PyPI. Because anything that's on PyPI can innovate very quickly. Anything that's in the standard library is frozen. Uh, but why now? Because Toml 1.0 was actually released a year ago. <laughs> it was standardized for packaging, but it was not standardized as a format, uh, as a you know, stable release of the format yet. So stable enough for packaging, not stable enough for the standard library. Uh, okay, so it, we need to add this now. Uh, next question is, which one do we add? There's a bunch of Toml libraries which will get copied into the standard library. Uh, there was Toml, which was unmaintained. I think the author was a bit overwhelmed with the uh, packaging world using their package uh, a lot, uh, so they disappeared. There's Tom Tomlkit, uh, which is too complicated. That's what Poetry uses. It's a very good package, recommend it if you want to deal with Toml. Uh, there's PyTomlPP, PP, which was written in C++, so we don't really want to uh, add a new dependency to Python. Uh, RToml uh, has the same problem. It's written in Rust, so we can't use it in CPython. Uh, there's Tomly, which can only read Toml, but not write it. We could write a new one, but uh, we'd really rather take something that works, because once it's put in the, into the standard library, we can't change the API. So what do we do? We wait. <laughs> we wait and let the, let, let the best package win. Uh, so actually, the solution is different. The solution is that we said that the Toml libraries are complicated. Most of them are very complicated. And there's one reason why they are complicated. And that's, the, that's uh, styling and style-preserving edits. So this is a slightly modified uh, 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 oh, sorry. S a slightly modified PyProject Toml from pip. Uh, and let's say uh, I have a package management tool that wants to edit this document. And I want to uh, change the file name to news.md and add a new field that says file, uh, file name format is markdown. Right? Uh, and I want this done automatically. 
So the library that reads and writes TOML would need to parse this uh, uh, structure, including the comments, because I need to uh, keep the comments once they're there. Uh, would need to uh, uh, somehow remember the indentation. It would probably be nice if it could indent the new entry the same way as, as the old entries are, are done. And uh, it also needs to remember if, uh, for example, the list in the second line is in line or if it's written out into multiple lines and so on. And that's called style preserving uh, modifications. Uh, and that combined with you know, adding new stuff to match the old style, that is really wrong and uh, really complicated. And uh, there are so many choices you need to make uh, to design the API, to design the data structures behind it. Uh, that I don't think any of the libraries uh, actually uh, was uh, good enough to put into the standard libraries in, library and still uh, and freeze forever. All right, so if, if you now install Tomlkit, for example, it has one way of doing things, which is fine, but it's not uh, perfect. So the decision that was made was uh, to... Oh, did I lose my focus or something? <sighs> Sorry. Here we go. So the decision was to go for Tomly, the read-only library. So the standard library can only read Tomly documents, which is very easy. You just map it into uh, lists and dictionaries and strings. No need to design new data structures. No need to des design APIs for styling and so on. And if you want to write Tomly documents, well, you can install a library for that. Uh, for the bootstrapping problem, we only need to read. For building a package, we only need to read the, doc read the configuration. Uh, if you need to change it, uh, you have all of PyPI at your disposal. So that, uh, that was the decision. And once that was made, things were pretty, uh, pretty uh, straightforward. It still took a uh, few people to get, get it through. There's uh, Tanelli, who is the author of Tomli, uh, who graciously agreed to uh, put this in the standard library, freeze it forever, and uh, maintain it there. Uh, there was Shantanu, with, who uh, wrote the document, uh, and uh, I uh, agreed to be the sponsor, which uh, basically means that I'm a trusted person, and whenever uh, Tanelli uh, can't maintain Tom, Tom, uh, the Tomo library anymore, I will drop whatever I'm doing and uh, step in and fix the issues. I didn't do much, but you always need somebody to you know, officially take care of the package, even though I don't really expect to do much work on this one. So that's Tomlib. Uh, oh, there's a lot of s on Slido. How much time do I have? Um, 15 minutes, including Q and A. So right. So. So uh, the other one, the other big features are hopefully a bit, uh, bit faster to go through. Find great error locations. So in Python 3.11, one thing you'll notice really soon is that in tracebacks, you get highlights uh, for where the error occurred. This is so nice. This is so nice. Uh, it, it's a bit smart. So as you can see in this traceback, this is taken from the pep and slightly edited for how it's done now. Uh, so uh, on, the, on the first line there, you can see that the, uh, the highlight is not given when the whole, exp whole line basically resulted in the error. Uh, in the last one, you can see that it kind of shows you uh, which sub-expression was, was the culprit. Right, so if it is, if it is, uh, if this says non type object is not subscriptable, it means the x z x y that one is none, and the uh, subscripting with the z failed. Right. Uh, so how did this get in? So this was the work of uh, three people. There's Pablo, uh, who is amazing. He's the release manager of uh, three eleven. And he was very much involved in the new Python parser, which uh, enables these things. He uh, is actually an astrophysicist. Uh, 
very smart, uh, knows a lot about this kind of internals. So, uh, and two relatively new people, there's Patuhan, which, uh, uh, which joined the, uh, well, Patuhan, who joined the core developers uh, right before this change for his work on uh, AST. And Amar, who uh, joined after this change, after he proved himself that you know uh, he uh, can uh, make uh, make changes like this, and we trust him enough to uh, to continue making them. Uh, so uh, Pablo actually spent a lot of time in three ten. I don't know if three nine, uh, but three ten definitely, improving syntax errors and error messages in general. So if you remember older versions of Python, you get syntax or invalid syntax, uh, figure it out. Uh, nowadays, you get lots of different messages depending on uh, what actually went wrong or what Python thinks went wrong. This is really helpful, especially for beginners. Uh, it uh, doesn't slow down uh, production significantly because you don't get syntax errors in production, right? <laughs> Hopefully. Uh, and uh, it really needs a lot, uh, it really needs a uh, deep understanding of how, how the parser works to, to uh, get this through. So I'm really happy we have Pablo on board. Uh, so Pablo said, you know, what should we uh, improve in our messages next? And people said, well, this one. I want to know what went wrong. Which one is zero? And uh, that requires uh, saving the position of information of each part of the line, right? So uh, I'll quickly go through how uh, Python code is compiled and how this position information is retained. So the first uh, step in the way is reading the source. So let's say I have the expression one plus two. Uh, Python uh, converts this to a token stream so it separates the one, the plus, and the two, and the new line, uh, throws away the comments and the white space, and so on. Uh, and you can see in the first column here that uh, it retains the line number and column number of the start and end of each token. So good, we have the information here. Next step is to construct uh, an abstract syntax tree, which is this uh, huge, uh, huge expression tree. Uh, here we have uh, expression with a binary operation. There's a constant one on the left and a constant two on the right, and there's a, an addition in the middle. But uh, all, of, uh, all of these uh, parts of the, of the tree still have uh, line and column information attached to them. So this was already done. Uh, but the next step is uh, compiling to bytecode, which is a really compressed version of uh, what the program should do. Here it's uh, four bytes. It says uh, basically load the constant three and return it. Uh, and attached to that is uh, not only the constant three, but also a line table, which is compressed information about which instruction maps to which line. And this needs to be extended. So this is extended in 3.11. Uh, it's about 22% bigger, and it includes the column information for each instruction that Python makes. 22% is a, quite a lot, right? So your bytecode caches, the PYC files, will increase by 22%. Hopefully you have enough disk space. Uh, the memory you need for code files in running programs will increase by 22%. Uh, luckily, programs don't uh, use that many code files, so overall the increase in memory usage is about 1%, which is still quite a lot. I mean, is it worth it to, to get these underlines if you're uh, running thousands of uh, containers in, uh, in Amazon or something? Uh, that's a decision you can make. You can set uh, Python debug ranges environment variable or run Python with no debug ranges. So if you do one of these, uh, you get your uh, memory usage back. This was a major argument for getting this in. <laughs> uh, it's probably something you want to do if, uh, if you're running on production. Thanks. 
wrapping up. OK, so very quickly, there were also speed ups, uh, which has a nice story uh, behind it. Mark Shannon uh, sent a proposal saying, I can make Python f five times faster in the next five years. Uh, please pay me to do it. Uh, the PSF is happy to take sponsor money and give them uh, for a project if the sponsor says it's for a project. The problem is this was at the beginning of the pandemic and financial situation wasn't that good. Uh, so this proposal didn't actually happen. But uh, one company who would have been the sponsor said, well, we have some money, so let's just hire Mark, who, by the way, has a, a PhD in, uh, in the area, so he's really knowledgeable about speeding, uh, speeding up virtual uh, machines. So uh, they actually hired not only Mark Shannon, but also Guido and Eric and uh, now Michael. I hope I'm not forgetting anyone because I don't actually know who's part of their team. So there's, now there's a team of four full-time people, which is about two time, which is, a, well, there was one full-time Python core developer before this. Now there's four. So there's a lot of focus on making Python fast, relatively speaking. Uh, and these uh, fine people are making Python faster. Uh, if you want the details, maybe leave them for questions. There's a lot of technical information that doesn't actually go that well on slides. So if you meet me at the conference, I'll be happy to uh, walk you through some of the optimizations. They're really fun if you're into that thing. And uh, before we go to Q&A, uh, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, read through what's new, follow the links, find your own stories. If you would like to join, file an issue on GitHub, send a pull request. Uh, and the best thing you can do if you're serious about helping Python and getting some new features in is joining, uh, is well, following the info in core mentorship, Google uh, Python core mentorship. There's a nice page with uh, links about how it's done. So how do the <laughs> How do the questions work here? Okay, so let's go. The question with the most upvotes at slido.com. Those of you who have not used slido, just go to slido.com, enter PyCon SK, and you can both ask questions and, and upvote questions. So the one with the most upvotes. Uh, with the yearly new Python versions, can we look forward to uh, to new features? each year for a long time, or everything has been invented already? So that's kind of like one question, and the other one is, what so, is your wish list? <laughs> uh, so uh, my wish list and the direction Python is going is for most features, look outside of Python. Uh, look outside the standard library, look into the stuff that's on PyPI. That can innovate at whatever pace it wants. Uh, once it's in Python itself, it should be really stable. Uh, we are changing too much, we are uh, breaking too much code, and we should stop that. Uh, and we have mechanisms to, to deal with that, and we should definitely follow them, uh, follow them better. Uh, that's, uh, well, <laughs> we're trying to deal with the influx of full-time core developers uh, who, well, are doing changes that are quite deep in the interpreter. And uh, it, you know, there's, there's some uh, improvements to be made. So if you, have, uh, if you use too much Python internals, 3.11 might break some of, uh, some of your libraries, unfortunately. But it'll be faster. <laughs> <laughs> it'll be a lot, lot faster. So focus on maintainability. There will be no uh, schism for, uh, you know, like Python 4, like, okay, let's just do the new thing again. Uh, Python 4 will probably deal with the C API uh, and less limited API, but uh, don't tell anybody I told you about Python 4. There's no plan for Python 4 at all yet. <laughs> please, please turn off YouTube like right now. <laughs> and it, no plans for Python 4. It'll, well, who knows what'll happen. If I get my way, we'll go, go to calendar versioning and have Python 35. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> the next one. <clears throat> How is JSON not easy 
to edit for humans, which is something you mentioned in your talk. Trailing commas. You, you need to add a comma to the line above when you add a new entry. <sighs> <laughs> and one style of quote marks? Come on. Which one is it? Double quotes or single quotes? <laughs> Why should I care? <laughs> no, seriously, if you're, if you're expecting humans to write uh, configuration or something like JSON, mm. yeah, JSON is not good for it. There are better formats. OK, next one. Uh, how are the Python enhancement proposals enumerated? Is it, is it an auto-incremented integer or uh, a random number? Or is there some hidden ASCII message? Uh, officially, the PEP editors will assign you a number. Uh, usually, uh, we skip that step and just get the next available number in the sequence. There are some special numbers. Uh, there are some special special ranges uh, of numbers. There are some special numbers like PEP 404 has a you know, special surprise. Uh, PEP 666 has a special surprise. <laughs> uh, yeah, so you, you can, uh, there's also one with a, uh, an obscure rock band reference, if I recall correctly, try finding that one. Uh, yeah, so yeah, you can, uh, Core devs can pick a number, but usually we choose the next one. Lovely. So it's basically incremental unless otherwise specified. OK, cool. Um, so which exciting features just did not get into the Python 3.11 bandwagon? So I'm, I'm really sad in hindsight about the C API function PyType from Metaclass not getting in, which would help helped a bunch of issues we're getting with C libraries. Uh, well. C, uh, not, not only C, but binding generators. Uh, who is enlightened by this? I was just blabbing on a feature I wanted, but <laughs> didn't get in. Uh, no, well, I don't know what's actually planned for 3.12. Surely a lot more speed ups. So thank you to Baptiste who asked this question. And the next one, why do you think the original async IO was not properly based on computer science theory? Oh, uh, well, one thing, this particular theory wasn't available yet, I think. It's uh, based on research into Go, uh, the Go statement in, in Go and stuff like that. Uh, but async IO was very practical. Uh, it was basically taking what's already there and making sure that uh, you can use all of these libraries or you can uh, wrap all of these libraries and use them with AsyncIO. Uh, it was not originally about making uh, async stuff easy to write as, as so much. Uh, that basically came later with the, uh, with the async statements and, and those improvements. And the final one, did you consult with Martin Sustrik for new ideas regarding structured concurrency when pre preparing exception groups? Uh, I didn't touch exception groups until they were already in, so uh, this is not actually a question for me. But uh, let's see, let's, uh, so which, which pip was it? Uh, Pep six five four. Uh, there is actually uh, uh, okay. Uh, find me uh, after this. I can't really control my computer with this setup enough to show you the web page. But there's a giant list of uh, thank yous in the pep, and if you find the name there, they uh, they were uh, consulted. Thank you so much, Peter. This was awesome. Thank you.
Mikrobit je programovateľný mini počítač, ktorý ti dovolí prepojiť informatiku s kreativitou. Dá sa programovať veľmi jednoducho a ovládať tak, aby robil presne to, čo chceš. O pár minút sme zvládli rozsvietiť vlastný obrázok na displeji a o chvíľu sme už obrázky diálkovo prepínali druhým mikrobitom. Mikrobit má v sebe aj super vychytávky, ako sú tlačidlá, senzor pohybu, kompas a teplomé. K mikrobitu ale môžeš pripojiť množstvo ďalších vecí. Tu programujeme, aká animácia sa nám má ukázať na LED pásiku. Ja som na ňom naprogramovala dúhu. Teraz programujeme podľa nôd kohútika Jarabého. Najlepšie na mikrobite je, že si viem vytvoriť napríklad blikajúceho robota alebo gitaru, ktorú ovládam tak, že ňou zatraciem alebo futbalovú bránku, kde mi mikrobit počíta, koľko gólov som dala, alebo kúlové svietiace topánky a tisíc ďalších vecí, ktoré ešte len vymyslím. Mikrobit je hračka, ktorú schováš do dlane a vytvoríš z nej čokoľvek. Tak čo s ňou spravíš ty? Každých 60 sekúnd si 28 tisíc ľudí predplatí službu Netflix. Odošle sa 197 miliónov e-mailov, stiahne sa 414 tisíc aplikácií a ukradne niekoľko tisíc hesiel. Na internete sa toho deje veľa. A všetko najdôležitejšie sa dozviete na Živé SK. Živé SK. Technológie ľudskou rečou.